Aloha. Welcome to American Issues Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host. And today's show is titled Trump's Ongoing War Against Law Enforcement. And before I get to my guests, um, as I was thinking about this title, uh, you know, it's a long, long trail of, of, of lawsuits and legal actions against the former president of the United States, Donald Trump. And I thought, well, before we can discuss it, we'll have to kind of refresh our memories. What is it that uh, the many um, engagements he is with law enforcement agencies and our private parties as well? So, uh, so bear with me here. I'll have to go down the list and then it's an extensive list. Uh, number one, investigation of violations of the President's Record Act. Well, that's the most recent one and we know what that's all about. And, the conversations about uh, top secret or confidential records uh, at Mar-a-Lago. So we'll see how that all shakes out. Number two, January 6th election interference, uh, the blocking of the business of uh, the United States Congress. Um, part of that uh, investigation is a possible incitement to attack the Capitol. What role was Donald Trump in the incitement of that, of that attack? Um, to defraud the US through up, uh, overturning election results. That's part of the whole mix. Uh, number three, um, a lot of you may not remember this, but uh, the Georgia criminal investigation of election crimes um, reminded the old country western song by um, Johnny Lee, looking for 11,780 votes and they're all in the wrong places. Uh, number four, financial issues, tax and back, bank fraud investigations. Uh, that's from the AG of New York, uh, Laletta James. And not to be outdone by that is, uh, although it's quiet, is the Southern District of Manhattan's investigation of tax fraud uh, by, by Donald Trump. Uh, you have to remember that was um, Alvin Bragg, formerly Cyrus Vance, that was in charge of that. Sexual misconduct allegations brought on by Gene Carroll. That's an old one sitting out there, but it hasn't gone away. The lawsuits of police officers that were uh, injured during the January 6th insurrection, uh, accusing Trump of inciting a riot that caused these injuries. A lawsuit from uh, Trump's niece, remember Mary Trump, she uh, fraudulently said uh, Donald Trump, or she has stated that fraudulently uh, Donald Trump cut her out of her inheritance. And there's a lawsuit out there waiting for him. And last but not least, Trump's former attorney, Michael Cohen, said that he was retaliated against Donald Trump and thrown back in jail as a result of his, um, self, his, his published memoir, um, Throwing Trump Under the Bus. So there was about nine or 10 just, um, just sitting out there. And um, if you're Donald Trump, he doesn't, have any problem going to sleep, but they out there, they're out there waiting for them. So without further ado, I would like to introduce my guests. Our special guest today is Chuck Crumpton. Uh, we have Jay Fidel, my co-host, and Cynthia Lee Sinclair. Good morning to one and all. Good morning, Tim. Welcome back. Thank you. Hey, Jay, uh, to you, you know, for months, you and I and, and the gang, uh, we weren't very kind to Merrick Garland. We said he was waiting for Godot. We must have said it 10 or 15 times. Well, as of this week, they've issued, the Department of Justice has issued 40 new subpoenas to a variety of individuals, most of them Trump uh, aides and top aides. Uh, has your opinion changed about the course of direction of the DOJ? And specifically, have you changed your mind about Merrick Garland? Yes, uh, but I'm not totally convinced. I think, um, you know, that there are things that he's done that we would have wished that he had done before, uh, but we're happy that he did those things, including the subpoenas and apparently the DOJ, uh, you know, investigation. I think probably on balance, the way I feel about it is that he must have been listening to Think Tech Hawaii and he ultimately got the right idea. Of course he was. <laughs> okay, so um, now, you know, you know, you got talking heads saying that this rash of of subpoenas and requests for uh, subpoenas for documents is basically going to set up the quiet period between right now and the midterm elections, and they'll basically be waiting through all these subpoenas and, and testimonies and documents uh, during that quiet period. Are you? Do you agree with that? And to your opinion, uh, Jay, how significant is this DOJ move? What, uh, with the subpoenas and, and more yeah. active investigation? Is this just yeah. uh, checking the boxes, or is this a significant move by DOJ? Oh, I think this reveals that they are, in fact, investigating Trump. Um, yes, and, and it encourages me. On the other hand, the 60-day rule does not encourage me. I, I wish it didn't exist. 
Uh, it's not statute, you know, it's uh, one of those uh, DOJ memoranda, which sometimes is wrong. Um, and it was in play, if you recall, when James Comey, who is a, really a centerpiece of, in my view, this conversation. Um, so, you know, it's too bad because, um, you know, if, if uh, Merrick Garland had started going public earlier, uh, if Joe Biden had been talking about it earlier, we wouldn't be faced with the 60-day rule. Um, and, uh, you know, there are things that will happen in the 60 days that the public should know about. The public should know that their former president is a felon um, and has, you know, has violated the law in so many ways. Uh, it could be that he gets indicted in the 60-day period. I think the public should know about that. But regrettably, I'm not sure the public will know about that. All righty. Thanks, Jay. Uh, to our special guest, Chuck Crumpton. Uh, Chuck, tell me something. Um, you know, it looks like, you know, these, these subpoenas were very broad-based in general in nature. Uh, yet, it seems to be a, a, a kind of a focus on um, Trump's fundraising events that uh, he, he tried to pull off, uh, not too dissimilar from um, Bannon's, you know, uh, build the wall charity and and pack uh, also the uh, they seem to be targeting the false electors that were assigned to certain states and last but not least um these subpoenas seem to be going after those who are in charge of the social media accounts for donald trump uh what's your sense of these these subpoenas and and whether or not um you you detect any certain pattern to them or do you just think they're general uh, they're general broad based uh in nature it's a great question, Tim. I think one of the things, if I've learned anything from over 35 years of mediating other people's conflicts, is look for what's missing, look for what's not there. This set of subpoenas does not focus in on core central elements for criminal intent and conduct on either the January 6th or Mar-a-Lago documents, but rather the secondary, the more peripheral issues. <clears throat> One of the things that may be is a sign <clears throat> that they've got hey, enough of what they want on that first set of really core issues that they can now start to build up the penumbra <clears throat> and see whether there's enough there to include it or not. Mm -hmm. So it may indicate that they're farther along than other people think. Second thing to pay attention to, Merrick Garland gets the attention because he's the AG, but the people who are really doing the work and maybe influencing his decision-making are a set of very highly experienced, qualified, relatively young prosecutors in the AG's department who are putting these things together and clearly incentivizing the movement in the direction toward actual prosecutions. So they haven't slowed. In fact, they broadened. And if anything, they've deepened their efforts. Mm -hmm. Well, because uh, they're broad. Tim, can I jump in yeah, on jump that? Up. Go ahead, Jay, jump in. Uh, I, I'm not a prosecutor. Um, I was a military prosecutor a long time ago. But this kind of prosecution strategy, it seems we have learned over the past few years that you look for the little guys first, and then you flip them, and you get them to you know testify against the bigger guys. So um, this could all be that. Um, you get the little guys, and then the next step, the next step, and finally you get the really big guys like Trump. Yeah. Uh, so but, I, I suspect that's the strategy going on now. Let me ask you, all of you, um, does this broad-based general subpoena, subpoenas that have been issued, does that play into the GOP narrative that this is yet again the government's effort for a witch hunt? Chuck? I think just the opposite. Everybody knows that Trump moved those documents out. It's got his Sharpie markings on many of them. Everybody knows that there are at least 150 very, very highly sensitive classified high security documents in there, but there, there's no reason 
to have removed to Mar al Laga. Hey, everybody knows that those were found through a deliberative process with judicial review, with support for it that's now been made relatively public. <laughs> so, claiming it's a witch hunt, so you're not what, hearing that much. More well, you say everybody. You say everybody, I'm sure you could find virtually millions of people in this country who still think it's a witch hunt, uh, who uh, are not being informed uh, and who believe that the, uh, you know, that, that Trump's criticism of the FBI and law enforcement in general is correct. And that poor bugger, uh, you know, is, is, the, is the victim, the victim, and, and they will not be swayed. Uh, so yes, those who read the newspapers are better informed, but that doesn't include everybody. Clearly All right. right. Thanks for the correction, Jay. <laughs> hey, C Cynthia, what do you think Donald Trump's motivation was to bring in these confidential top seek documents? Was it a matter of them just throwing things in a box or uh, what's, what's your opinion? And I'll say opinion because it, we don't have the facts yet and we can't get inside of the mind of Donald Trump, thank God. Um, but what's your opinion of why these highly sensitive top secret documents were squirreled away at Mar-a-Lago? What was the what was the motivation? What was the ultimate purpose of that? Well, in my opinion, um, he lives in his wallet. We pretty much know he's all about money, right? So my guess is he wants to sell them or use them as a way to blackmail somebody down the road. That's what narcissists do. I mean, it's kind of textbook even, right? That's but don't you think he knows the definition of treason? <laughs> Sorry. Um. <laughs> but he thinks he's above the law. Yeah. So well, let me just kind of get an informal survey here. How many of you <laughs> believe that Donald Trump had an alternative motive for those documents, either to sell them, share them, use them as blackmail in the future, um, or some other nefarious motivation? Well, the other nefarious possibility on your little list is to somehow scuttle the, Bi the Biden administration, yeah. disable them, the way he did in the transition, make it impossible for them to um, you know, know what's going on in the world, no critical secrets they need uh, for you know, making nuclear policy. <coughs> that, that should be on your list also. Well, that's kind of what I meant by blackmail, to use it against other people. I guess I should have been a little more specific mm -hmm. about blackmail. But to use it against other people, absolutely to use it against the Biden administration. And remember, he's always shooting for that long con, that 2024 run, right? So um, these documents he could have been thinking could maybe help him move forward in his um, bid for the presidency again. And, and if I could just answer or, or address one other thing that you had brought up that um, the investigation in New York, the criminal investigation that Vance used to be running and now that Boggs guy does. After, when, at, when it got to the point where Vance was going to retire, he had brought in, just beforehand, he had brought in two high-powered uh, criminal prosecutors that that's their specialty, is dealing with this white-collar crime stuff. These guys, when Vance left and Boggs came in and said, well, I don't think we really have anything. We're not really going to go forward with this and started trying to shove it under the rug. Those two prosecutors, they absolutely resigned in protest and came out publicly and said, there was enough evidence to indict. And this Boggs guy is the guy who kiboshed the whole thing. So we got to remember that, even though we don't think about that investigation much anymore, because Boggs has put it under the carpet, right? Um, so- You mean, you mean Bragg? Bragg is his name. That? Huh? Bragg. Bragg. Bragg, not Boggs, sorry, Bragg. Excuse me, thanks for the correction. Yeah. Um, I was close. At any rate, so we got to remember that that's an important factor. That that investigation has been deliberately taken out of the news. And then there's one more thing that's important that just came out recently. 
And that is the whole, uh, the investigation, there's new news that just, I just started hearing about yesterday. Um, and that is the whole Michael Cohen uh, person one and uh, or individual one and you know all that stuff. Afterwards, Bill Barr made went in and scrubbed all the paperwork and took out any reference of individual one. That is a very important factor that we need a little more information on. But I want to bring it up. Okay, everybody, keep that in your back of your mind to you know watch that space because I think we're going to be finding out some really important stuff. So now we see Barr. Well, that that may came up come up with the January sixth House Hearing Committee um, meetings that are going to take place here start up again shortly. So who knows if if Bill Barr comes up as a subject matter or not? No, the point, the point is that he is that Trump could have been and was in fact identified yeah. by Michael Cohn. It could have been prosecuted or at least investigated. And under Bill Barr, he wasn't. And uh, you know the whole reference to individual one went out the window. Uh, another example of Bill Barr's uh, partisanship. Well, Jay, to you on, on Bill Barr, I don't wanna to get too far off the track here with Bill Barr, but um, he's been pretty, critical and pretty uh, informative of the Mar-a-Lago document case. Uh, he's come out extremely, uh, pretty tough on it. Uh, what's what's going on with that? I, I don't think he's found religion. <laughs> I, I don't think he's, you know, discovered a new morality for himself. I think it has something to do with his Okole. <laughs> okay. Well, you know what? I agree. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you, Cynthia. Hey, Jay, um, let's talk about the special master. Do you think that the DOJ uh, played Trump's team, played Trump and Trump's team quite well by surprisingly agreeing on a judge that um, they could agree on to be a special master? Yeah. Um, you know, you know, uh, Chuck, it's just like uh, peremptory challenges, you know, in selecting a jury. Uh, sometimes you leave somebody on who may not be obviously on your on your team, but uh, you do it for a tactical reason because you only have so many peremptory challenges. And I think the uh, part of the mm, strategy of the DOJ on this this judge <coughs> theory um, was that uh, if they fought with everything that the Trump lawyers were suggesting, with every nominee the Trump lawyers were suggesting. Uh, they'd be fighting and fighting and fighting, and there would be no agreement on anything. And the judge, who we have zero confidence in, uh, Aileen Cannon, um, would you know would just pick a Trump uh, suggestion. In this case, they I think they did the right thing. Uh, they picked somebody who is likely to work in their favor um, somehow. Um, and uh, they you know it was like judo. Uh, they they let the Trump team fall on its own petard here. Um, so I think it was good strategy. We'll see how it works out, though. It's, you know, um, the jury's still out on exactly what kind of a job he'll do and how partisan he might be and uh, whether the recommendations that he makes will be accepted by uh, Aileen Cannon. Um, he probably knows a lot more law and a lot more about how a special master might function and how a district judge might function. Um, so she should be listening to him, but that's not clear. Tim, well, the other thing question. to remember, Tim, no. that you emphasized in an earlier episode is a primary component of the Trump team's strategy, and it's not a very good legal team, actually, is to stall, delay it. Beyond well, that's that was my next question. Yes, as as close to 2024 as possible. This completely guts that. It, it gets it into the hands of a special master, a special master who's probably likely to move fairly quickly on this stuff. Second thing to remember, DOJ and the FBI know exactly what's in there. They know what's on every page on every one of those documents. They know what's going to be found. So they've got a they're manifesting a high confidence level that this process is going to move effectively 
and relatively quickly compared to what Trump wanted to prevent. Because of, despite the deniers who are delusional, despite the fact that those of us who are paying any attention to the facts know what was in those documents, know where they were, and know how close to criminal conduct that is. Well, yeah. One other very interesting point is this. Um, you know, this is all riddled with the, the problem of classified information, of the highest possible classified information. And, uh, you know, people have questioned whether a special master who didn't have a security clearance should be looking. For that matter, a district judge who didn't have a security clearance should be looking. Luckily, and this may have been part of the strategy of the DOJ, um, Deary was on the FISA court. Mm -hmm. And the FISA court all have security clearances at the highest level. They have to. So, you know, they also, another positive thing about their choice is they avoided, you know, the whole risk, the whole issue about security clearances. Right. Good point. Excellent point. Um, so what, what we want to know is, hey, hey, did Trump's lawyers forget to consult the Federalist Society on this one? <laughs> Good point, Chuck. Uh, <laughs> Cynthia, you wanted to get a word in. Go ahead. I just wanted to ask a question. It's sort of a legal question that I've had a lot of people ask me, and I can't find the answer for. And that is, why does this Judge Cannon have any standing when it was already, there was already a judge that was sitting on this um, case, that the one who um, authorized the search warrant. So why was Trump allowed to go there? Why did that judge have any kind of a, 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 a standing to even do anything with it? Why hasn't the DOJ just filed to get it out of her back to the original judge? Why couldn't that happen? Do you? You know, we talked about this uh, while you were gone, Tim. And um, it's very interesting that in the federal system, um, when a case is filed, a judge is uh, assigned, right, Chuck? The judge is assigned, and the judge, uh, district judge, takes that case right on through, including trial. Um, and you always know that the judge who was assigned is the judge who will handle everything. Um, in this case, they, the Trump team went shopping. And they went, went to another judge. By the way, um, Reinhardt is a magistrate, right? Not a district judge. Okay, keep that keep that in your mind. Um, they went shopping. They went eighty miles away to another courthouse, uh, another district judge, another district, I think, in Florida. And they found this woman who Trump had appointed, who had no experience and who was gullible. Um, and uh, they went to her because they were judge shopping. Now, what's interesting about this is that the rule of assigning a judge, uh, it, didn't, it didn't get enforced. Um, it was ignored. And, and this raises the whole question about uh, the, 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 the protocols uh, in, in the district courts. They violated the protocols, but the protocols aren't law. And they found a weakness in the protocols that nobody would actually stand up and say, wait, Eileen, you can't do this. This is sitting in another district, another judge. But since there's no mechanism to enforce that protocol, she did it, and there's nothing the DOJ could have done. And it's really sad because it's such an obvious case of improper judge shopping. Is that something to be appealed on that basis, Jay? I'll leave that to Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> the DOJ has so many better arguments. Things to go after, yeah. Deficiencies in her opinion. Um, she lacked a jurisdiction, as Cynthia indicated. She elevated unfounded claims of political bias over national security. She in chose to interfere in a civil case in a criminal investigation. Yeah. Uh, there's, there's is, a whole laundry list. Is Neil it worth Patel did a great job of parsing Chuck, out about a week ago. Chuck, is it worth the DOJ's time to actually appeal in the 11th uh, District Court? It, it will be, but they want to posture it as well with this particular case, with this judge, as they can. 
before that time to appeal comes up and they've got to file it. Right. Well, I'll remember no that uh, they, will file. they did move for reconsideration of her order uh, on one point, uh, namely her order that the um, the DOJ investigation should stop. Um, and this is, you know, that's that's a reasonable thing to do. And a reasonable judge would say, OK, OK, yeah, that, that's overreaching. I'm not going to stop the DOJ from doing its investigation. There's no good reason at all. Um, and that's pending with Eileen Cannon now. Or is yeah. it Reinhardt? It might be Reinhardt. I'm not sure. No, it had to be. It had to be Eileen Cannon. She's the one who issued the order in the first order. place. Yeah. So, um, you know, that, that's a real problem because she could take her sweet time on the motion for reconsideration, thus, as we discussed, delaying all this. And then it, it seems to me, to answer your question, Tim, the DOJ should, must appeal, even with a kind of mandamus appeal, asking for immediate relief from the 11th Circuit. But we know that Trump loaded the 11th mm -hmm, Circuit right. with Trumpers. Chances of, of winning on that point or any point at the 11th, at the, at the 11th Circuit is really remote, actually. Right. So my Good question point. is, can, is it too late to take it back now? Is it too late to go after that? You don't have jurisdiction. Your order was bad. We're taking it back. Is it too late for that? Or can they still do that? That'd be part of the appeal process, would it not? It would. Uh, but it's not their strongest grounds. Her yeah. decision is so flawed legally and factually that that's a, even with six out of 11 of the 11 circuit judges having been appointed by Trump. And, and they don't get it as a whole in bank first anyway. They get it in a trio usually of three. Yeah. So what they would do is depends on who gets selected and how they want to go. Okay. Cynthia, uh, we're almost out of time, and I want to run something past you. And that is, um, to what degree has the GOP narrative uh, been effective at this, um, this document search at Mar-a-Lago? Uh, if you remember, their first initial um, claim was that the FBI were putting documents in the boxes. <coughs> They're planting evidence. Then they said, okay, well, um, Donald Trump gave a blanket declassification for all documents and now they're saying it's like not returning a library book how effective is the gop response to all this they they do and now it's all bleeding into some of the other mainstream news outlets it's not just on fox that you hear this crazy stuff or just on oan or newsmax it's bleeding now we hear it on cnn now um Shoot, just the other day, Erin Burnett, who has her own show now during the week on CNN, spent her whole show talking about Hunter's laptop. Um, it's just, that's the kind of stuff that they're putting out there. Anything to deflect and, you know, uh, disinform, misinform people, to lead them to undermine the truth and the reality of what's going on. And what's really it's not just the GOP that's, you know, getting points by saying all this stuff. We don't hear it from the other side giving us the opposite truth. We don't hear the truth coming out of the other side. Like the fact that every time we hear, well, he declassified everything. We should be hearing, it doesn't matter whether they were classified or not. The charges and the um, specific search well, warrant had nothing to do with classified. Well, didn't we hear somewhat that saying Donald Trump didn't have the authority on his own um, presidential wave of his hand to declassify top secret documents? Didn't we hear that from the uh, from the Democrats and from um, legal legal minds? At first, but we are not really hearing it now. Okay. And that's what I meant by every time they say it. And these guys say it 24 seven. So if we only say it yeah, once- Well, that's, that's their strength. Have, it's not good enough. Exactly. They need to start talking about it every day. Yeah. And this is the other thing they need to say that counters that. And that is this, that even if he declassified them, they are not allowed to leave the White House or a, you know, a, a certain locked skiff that, has, that is guarded, a guarded skiff. So it doesn't matter, classified or not classified. 
does not matter. And well, that'll play that'll no. play to the Presidential Records Act um, allegations and those potential charges that the DOJ will or will not come up with. Hey, we've right. run out of time, uh, Cynthia, and I don't want to cut you short, but we've run out of time. So I want to go around the table very quickly and uh, ask for last thoughts. Jay Fidel. We're heading toward the election. There's so much confusion out there. Although the New York Times had a story yesterday um, to the effect that Trump's excuses have run out of gas. Um, not everybody reads the New York Times. I mean, he, the New York Times has convinced me that's easy. But a lot of people don't read it, don't want to read it, don't believe it. Um, <clears throat> but in fact, logically, his excuses have run out of gas. He doesn't have any excuses. And he has, he has never said why he took them out of the White House anyway. You know, that problem. Uh, <clears throat> that's one thing. The other thing is um, that 60-day rule really troubles me. Um, there's going to be all kinds of confusion. Uh, next thing is that um, there's a, if you saw, there's a move by the GOP to do document requests of election officials all around the country. Oh. Thousands and thousands of document requests, which sucks up their time and distracts them from doing their job as election officials. Very troubling. Uh, uh, you know, very, very bad, very malign is what it is. And the third thing uh, that came out yesterday, day before, um, is that uh, Mr. Putin was found to have given $300 million um, to autocrat candidates and officials in 2016, including Trump, and in 2020, and is probably still doing it today. Well, wait uh, a minute. Isn't that illegal for foreign entities to give to uh, national elections? Of course it is. Oh, yeah. and, and, they, and they do it in strange ways, but they do it. And that was the Times revelation. It came from the intelligence community. So we have that process continuing right now. My, my point is that <clears throat> Trump is leading, orchestrating uh, a, a, a nationwide attempt to confuse people and to confuse and undermine the election coming in November. And what we have been talking about is part of it. There are lots of other parts, and they are all emerging now with the likely prospect that the public will be confused. The election will be undermined. I'm sorry to tell you. Okay, Jay, thanks for your, your thoughts. Uh, Chuck, to you, your last thoughts. Okay, three things that your great guidance has helped us cover today that we know about narcissists. One, everything is leverage. It doesn't matter what it is, where it comes from. It's all leverage. Yeah. Second, because they're above the law, they're untouchable, they're unaccountable. It doesn't matter how they get it. It doesn't matter what they do with it. It's leverage. Mm -hmm. But number three is they will turn on, they will undercut, they will betray and hang out to dry anyone. That's the Bill Barr story. He has now figured that out. <laughs> <laughs> and he's now saying, screw you too. Yeah. <laughs> you got to be careful who you do that with because Cohen, Barr, and a few others, Mathis, some of the generals, are people who are respected and articulate in some areas. So look out for that area number three. And it's why he's having trouble getting leadership. Not only does he stiff them like Giuliani, but he screws them. Like yeah, I'm, rem I'm reminded of that book that came out years ago. Everything Donald Trump touches dies. <laughs> I forget who wrote it, but what a title. Okay, Chuck, thank you for your last thoughts. Cynthia, you get the last word for today. Okay, gosh, we talked about so many important things that- Yes, we have. Um, it's, it's hard to know where to go with that because obviously there's, you know, American Issues Part 2 tomorrow. <laughs> and I'm sure there's more for that day and all in the weeks to come. And and it is my, my honor. It really is an honor to be able to keep this stuff at least out there on the airwaves. You know, whoever hears it, will, we will not stop. Whether everybody else does or not, I know we won't. And I, I'm glad to be part of that. And you've got to be part of this team. So no. I have a quote. What else is new? <laughs> I have a quote to end with. And it's from Liz Cheney. Um, 
and it is this. Every American must consider this, Ms. Cheney said. Can a president who is willing to make the choices Donald Trump made during the violence of January 6th ever be trusted with any position of authority in our great nation again? And that was just referring to the behavior on that day. That doesn't even include any of the rest of the stuff we've talked about. So it's just- glad, glad you brought that quote to our, to our attention, Cynthia. Thank you so much. Uh, a great quote by Liz Cheney. Uh, <laughs> we've run out of time. So I'd like to say uh, thank you to our special guest, Chuck Crumpton. Thank you to our, my co-host, Jay Fidel, and Cynthia, as always, my gratitude and thanks to you. Until then, join us next week for American Take One. I'm Tim Apicelli, your host, and we hope to see you then. Much aloha. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.